mid 1990s, I sometimes found myself invited to go onto radio programs late at night to talk about British national identity. And I was struck by the way in which some of the other people on these shows would talk about how bad they felt about the way in which the Union flag and other symbols of British national identity had been colonised by the far right. This, I suppose, was part of the setting for the New Labour project. This was a country that had in the 1960s been told it had lost an empire and not yet find, found a role. In the 1980s, Robert Hewison, in his book, The Heritage Industry, famously pointed out that uh, the wallowing of nostalgia for a lost industrial preeminence, similarly, was a kind of intellectual death of the country in which all these museums celebrating that past, but no future was emerging. If you like, part of the um, role of New Labour then was to come up with some new form of what Britishness meant, to recapture that flag, to talk about the future rather than about the past, to use this language of Britain, a young country, riding upon the Cool Britannia moment of the surge of Britpop in the 1990s, which predated Blair coming to power in the same way that his predecessor, Harold Wilson, had tried to use the first wave of Cruel Britannia in and swinging London in the 1960s. Britain was to become emotionally articulate. Blair's invocation of the notion of the people was about inclusivity rather than exclusivity, as it has subsequently become. The language was about a process of social inclusion rather than the kind of demonising of enemies within, which had characterised the Thatcher period. And the country itself was to be reinvented, revamped, if you like, through a series of constitutional changes, including the process of devolution that Blair inherited as a commitment from his predecessor, John Smith. Intrinsic to Blairism then, was a narrative of cultural renewal. This was not the only aspect that mattered to the government which came to power in 1997. They were able to also play upon a uh, revived sense of labour economic competence. Certainly the Tories have lost their reputation for economic competence since 1992. And the commitment to retaining the Conservative spending plans for the first two years ensured that some of the um, weapons that the Conservatives generally rolled out to attack them had become blunt. The kind of tax whammy that uh, the Tories had used in 1992 also was blunted by Labour posters pointing out 22 Tory tax rises since that election. In that circumstance, both, if you like, the rising cultural politics, which have become increasingly palpable in the 21st century, and the continuing resonance of the politics of the distribution of social goods, which was so central to the 20th century, played into the emergence of the People's Prime Minister seen here with Cherie in mourning in 
as the nation in 1997 marked the passing of the people's princess, Diana. New Labour thus had at its core, like all successful electoral coalitions, a national narrative. This spans from the aspiration to an ethical foreign policy, including the view that the post-Cold War world enabled more intervention to prevent humanitarian crises and genocides, such as those earlier in the 1990s in Rwanda and Srebrenica, which, it was argued, the Tories had failed to address, to the attempts to replace the Tory language of dependency culture with one of social inclusion in the area of welfare policy. New Labour incorporated the view that modern creative industries could be leading edges of economic renewal for the young and thrusting country Blair proclaimed Britain to be. This comforting language was designed to unite, leaving the Tories and their ceaseless internal squabbling over Britain's place in Europe looking unfit for power. Instead, Blair tried to use the moment when the centre-left were in power across much of Europe, as was the case in the late 1990s and start of the 21st century, to relaunch the European project, working with people such as Gerhard Schroeder, the SPD Bundeskanzler in Germany. Through this, they aim to tackle things such as low productivity, income inequality and environmentalism on a Europe wide basis through the programmes launched at European summits, Lisbon in 2000, Luxembourg in 2001 or Gothenburg in 2003. Blair's third way beyond capitalism or socialism or indeed modified Keynesianism, meanwhile at home, attempted to inclusively span the political spectrum by seizing the language of responsibility and duty from a demoralised Conservative Party, as one Tory staffer told me about in about 2000, we just wanted to crawl under a rock under the defeat in, after the de defeat in 1997, and also moving the left beyond a language of equality by also promoting a wider range of opportunities for individuals to advance themselves and their families, as Blair put it in The Third Way, published by the Fabian Society in 1998. This reconciling of different traditions or magpie-like magpie borrowing from liberalism, conservatism and social democracy, if you prefer, was all intended to build the open, fair and prosperous society to which we aspire, to again quote from the th third way. These broad goals, if a little ambiguous, were also politically astute, as people could project onto them a range of their own aspirations. The temporary demise of the Tories, their brand trashed and identity largely determined by Labour, made this easier. Largely until 2003, a pivotal moment in Blair's premiership, the Iraq War, he reigned unchallenged. Even the press largely supported him in the elections in 1997 and 2001. This story I've been telling here illustrates that style and political communications were important ingredients in the new Labour mix. But the project of renewal in areas ranging from the health service to trying to find an end to the troubles in Northern Ireland shows that this was not simply a facade. As the private eye cover here from the 13th of September 2003 suggests, contemporary comment often focused on the notion that Blair's government was all spin, often emanating from his Eminence Greece, Alistair Campbell as his press secretary for the first six years in power. Style, in terms of the question, however, is about more than spin. Peter Hennessy's contemporary analysis of Blair's governance described it as a court 
a system in which Cabinet, already undermined by Thatcher, increasingly no longer functioned as the forum of the political leadership of the government. It was instead allegedly replaced by social, sofa government, cosy chats with individual ministers in which much of the business of government was transacted, or the unscripted briefings to Cabinet in the run-up to the Iraq War. This arguably did not matter that much to begin with, at least in terms of its impact upon the reputation and functioning of the government. Blair was able to shake off the allegations of um, favouritism in the context of the Eccleston affair um, on with the words most people think I'm a pretty straight kind of guy. However, having promised so much and majored so much on attacking Tory sleaze when New Labour were in opposition, it was important to live up to such things rather than feeding the cynicism which culminated against the backdrop of the global financial crisis of 2008 in the parliamentary expenses scandal of 2009. In other words, if you're going to build your reputation and your brand around a renewal in the aftermath of Tory sleeves, then you need to avoid some of that mud sticking to you as well. Blair enjoyed massive majorities in 1997 and 2001, but he also faced backbenchers prepared to challenge him on particular issues, not least on social policy in his first term. His public persona nonetheless seemed impregnable. Little conflicts such as Sierra Leone and Kosovo in 1999 furthermore suggested a decisiveness and capacity for successful intervention, whilst Blair's Chicago speech, also in 1999, indicated a thought-out approach to intervention in failing states to contain the spillover effects of conflict and its concomitant downsides such as trafficking, trafficking, international crime and refugees, to name but three. All of this helped to make sense of such interventions to the British public. Even fictional portrayals such as Hugh Grant here in 1999's Love Actually were more than benign. Blair only faced more serious crises at home with the fuel protests of 2000 and the foot and mouth crisis of 2001. The first led to a back down on the fuel duty escalator by the government, and the second was arguably mishandled in a crisis that saw piles of burning animals in the countryside and a quarter of the British ruminant population killed. Governments can be judged by how they handle both the unfolding of their agendas and the crises that from time to time crop up and try to catch them out. On the latter, governments are expected to show competence and decisiveness in the short term, which by and large seems to have been the verdict of the electorate in 2001. On the former, they need a narrative, what Jim Bullpit called statecraft. This was, for New Labour, a programme of renewal around long-delayed, or allegedly long-delayed, improvements to the welfare state, more so than the agenda of constitutional change of the first term. As Labour posters in 2001 reminded, don't forget to vote for schools and hospitals on Thursday. This sounded much more persuasive than voting against the government who had presided over the foot and mouth crisis. The first element in the new Labour narrative was forged in opposition, and indeed, to some extent, arguably in opposition to his own party. All leaders of the opposition, 
to some extent, have to rebrand their politics and their parties in their own image. Blair, pictured here in 1982 on his first attempt to get into Parliament in the Beaconsfield by-election of that year, a year before he won Sedgefield, inherited a party already in the polls when John Smith, pictured here next to him, died in 1994. John Smith, his predecessor as party leader. However, Blair was conscious of the need to kill the negative baggage still attached to Labour's identity from the alleged failures of the 1970s, the winter of discontent and such like. Hence, the replacement of the commitment to nationalisation in Clause 4, the careful um, distancing from the trade unions, promises to maintain fiscal responsibility and the emphasis on rights as well as duties expressed not least in the New Deal programme of workfarism adapted in part from Clinton's America. In such modernising processes, we could argue that style and substance in practice went together. In addition, a series of policy commissions were established on a whole series of policy areas, a tactic Blair kept up even when entering government, committing arguably the common error of running a government as if still in opposition. In opposition, however, these policy commissions and the statements that came out from them, more importantly, um, proved to be central in the process of establishing an impression of new Labour's competence and seriousness, therefore its fitness to govern, as well as ensuring that Labour's rhetoric dominated the airwaves against the struggling and internally, internally divided Tory government of John Major. The aphorism runs that um, oppositions don't win elections, governments lose them. But I would argue that in 1997, it was a bit of both. It should be noted as well that the left needed to adapt to the end of the Cold War, the loss of faith in Keynesianism and the impact of Thatcherism and new public management. Blair was not alone in seeing this. Donald Sassoon in the book pictured here in his reflections on the history of the European left, published in the early 1990s, concluded that socialism could no longer be promoted, if it ever could, in one country, but that Europe could be a means to reintroduce labour regulations and more equitable policies, in light of Maastricht's social chapter, to the British scene. Blair was impressed by European ideas such as flexicurity as market related means of promoting more flexible labour markets, which also provided more security and stability to workers. These were third way solutions, to use the phrase coined by Anthony Giddens, the sociologist then at the head of the LSE, and adapted by Blair and his team. In that post Cold War moment, there was interest in renewal and revival of civil society, not least after Thatcher's seeming dismissal that there was any such thing. There was also interest in humanising the new public management she bequeathed by adapting the Thatcherite language of targets to a focus on service delivery for end users. In numerous areas from policing to personal social services, it didn't quite turn out like that. Nonetheless, the aspiration indicates that there was more to this government, the government of Tony Blair and New Labour, than simply spin. There were, however, also some dissonant noises from the government. It was not all about renewal and a young country. Indeed, to some extent, the Blair government played into a rhetoric of uh, demonising the young and the uh, vulnerable that played with uh, the perceptions already being promoted in the right-wing press. 
Blair didn't have the kind of Thatcherite language of scroungers and so on, but he did have his own enemies within. And these were the people who were given ASPOs, antisocial behaviour orders. Apparently feral youths uh, who uh, were in the public imaginary located on the decaying council estates bequeathed by Mrs Thatcher's right to work policy where large numbers, uh, sorry, right to buy policy where um, in, in consequence of that large numbers of the people who were left in the residualized housing of those estates um, were not actually in work. So allocating ASBOs to such people was seen as a way of being tough on those individuals within society who threatened the fabric of civil society. This was, if you like, a civil redress for a social malaise, but it sat not entirely easily with the language of social inclusion, and it was arguably within the right wing imagination of uh, Fairweather Friends, such as the Daily Mail, exacerbated by the attempts of Blair and his government to promote a more European style society, such as through the 2003 Licensing Act, a piece of legislation which was billed as trying to introduce a kind of French style cafe culture to Britain, but instead the 24 hour licensing that it introduced proved to be of benefit primarily to supermarkets who allowed free loading on the part of millennials who wished to get tanked up, something which rapidly became added to the mix of this um, image of uh, youths who drank too much, graffitied too much and essentially were somewhat socially disruptive and lawless, particularly against the backdrop of the influences coming from the states of the need to tackle what were called signal crimes, the broken window syndrome, such that this had gone back some decades, but it really took off in the Blair period alongside the notion of community policing um, and the idea that that community policing, on the one hand, rebuilding communities, reconnecting with people, having visible and friendly, one hopes, um, uh, police presence on the streets, uh, also played into this image of um, we need to protect these communities against these disruptive threats. And so to some extent, Blair's arguably well-intentioned uh, ideas also had within them the seeds of their own destruction by creating a um, rhetorical space in which right-wing agendas could move back um, and reinforce fears and anxieties of um, the uh, the risk of crime and the risk uh, of damaged property uh, that all this language of ASBOs created instead of in the long term uh, helping to create a more communitarian language for the left arguably it reanimated the language of the right Probably the most famous example of Blair trying to combine style and substance is, however, the pledge cards 
Um, and what we have here is the pledge cards from 1997 uh, in the top corner, and then the one with Blair's picture on from 2001. The idea here is that you're creating some kind of contract uh, with the public and uh, saving the knowledge that most people don't read the manifesto. This is something uh, which it was easy to distribute um, and ensure that people had a sense of what New Labour meant and what they intended to deliver. And also it was a um, earnest of uh, the intention to keep these promises. The promises, however, focus upon particular actions rather than a narrative. You can also see from them the kinds of things that New Labour thought people were focused on, um, and particularly among those target groups. So big emphasis upon mortgages, particularly in 2001. Um, emphasis upon the NHS and on nurses, emphasis upon schools, um, emphasis upon killing the negatives in the area of um, economic policy. And just in case you hadn't got the message, you've also got the reminder in the poster from 2001 here showing William Hague and Michael Portillo that it was the Conservatives who had last damaged the economy um, and that if they were let in again then schools and hospitals those kinds and possibly mortgages all of those things uh, that people cared about and were seen as having been trashed by the Tories in the 1990s, could be damaged again. In other words, part of New Labour's uh, persona, public performance, is very much against the backdrop of the unelectability of the Conservative Party. Schools and hospitals are very visual markers of the contract with the public that Blair was offering, particularly when it's new build. And as the government wore on, plenty of new builds occurred, mostly funded by the private finance initiative, which had been started somewhat tentatively under Ken Clark as the um, as John Major's chancellor in the mid 1990s. Labour, however, took this much further building large numbers of shiny new hospitals, often running forward, burdened with problematic levels of debt, uh, which has had a persistent impact upon the ability to deliver on their mission. This, of course, tells us that the macro figures are not everything that matters. What we can see here from one side of the slide is that health spending is going up whilst government spending as a percentage of GDP is going down. In other words, um, health spending is going up considerably faster um, as a, 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 and it is also a increasing proportion of the total government spending. Nevertheless, what matters in the end is not only the increasing spending, but the quality of the spend. And by the end of the new Labour government, there's con concerns about MRSI, a a SA, um, hospital acquired infections, um, and the extent to which hospitals such as the Stafford Hospital have been pushed to by the target culture into cutting corners with um, detrimental effects for their patients. Because at the start of New Labour's term in office, the focus was very much upon one kind of metric, which was 
the amount of time you had to wait to be uh, admitted to hospital for things like elective surgery. And as you can see from the other graph here, that um, is one of Labour's successes. Inpatient waiting times steadily come down. This is a great success. However, it's only one measure. And as people start to become concerned about quality of service as well as the speed of service, or increasingly concerned about things like that, um, by the end of the new Labour period in office, this is no longer working for them in the same way. Uh, indeed, some of the things that they've done are felt to have undermined these successes. And at the same time, the record on the economy starts to become tarnished as well, which is what Peter Brooks cartoon in the Times from the uh, 29th of October 2008 is getting out. This is after Blair's left office, Gordon Brown, Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1997 to 2007, then Blair's successor as Prime Minister, is now presiding over a rapidly worsening situation in terms of government spending. Admittedly, this is not by any means all New Labour's fault. It's part of a global financial crisis in which swift action was taken by Brown to try and stench, uh, staunch the, 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 the problem. Um, it is, however, a uh, image that comes to be used by the Conservative Party in uh, that period as they finally, under Cameron, succeed in relaunching themselves as a credible opposition, picking up on what they say, what they argue is broken Britain. Um, so, uh, and in the process, they're using some of the rhetoric of Blair around um, social malaise, etc., against the new Labour government and using the idea that spending needs to be done more effectively rather than just focusing upon these macro changes. Um, in the end, as well, they use the notion that um, the Labour government has spent all the money unwisely that in George Osborne's language they didn't fix the roof while the sun was shining to help to get them just about over the line in the general election in 2010 and bring the 13 years of Blair Brown governments to a close. In the meantime, however, a number of substantial changes were affected by the new Labour governments. In the first term, probably the most noticeable uh, series of changes, though it's not on that 1997 pledge card, was the programme of constitutional change, which Jack Straw, the incoming Home Secretary, described as the biggest since the Glorious Revolution of 1688. It was arguably not quite as joined up a programme of change as might have been desired, uh, nor does it necessarily have Blair's fingerprints all over it. Blair only made one speech on the Constitution, which was his John Smith Memorial Lecture in 1996, before he becomes Prime Minister. However, he um, delegated the programme of constitutional change to his one-time mentor, the Scottish lawyer Derry Irving, who became Lord Chancellor, pictured in the middle of this 
photograph here. Constitutional change arguably started with Blair's own changing of the Labour Constitution, uh, Labour Party Constitution, with uh, the rewriting of Clause 4 and so on, and largely the limit of his direct interest in such things. Indeed, some cynics might argue that to some extent the constitutional agenda that uh, he inherited from Smith was partly there because of an anxiety that they may not win the election, let alone win a majority of 179, uh, and might need to govern with the support of the rather more constitutionally minded Liberal Democrats with whom they set up a fairly uh, meaningless um, joint constitutional review committee. There is, however, a substantial series of important constitutional changes introduced in that first term. The Human Rights Act 1998 incorporates the European Convention on Human Rights into British law, partly arguably to prevent the embarrassment of being taken to Strasbourg um, and having cases found against the British government. It changed the way in which law had to function, um, particularly when it was supplemented by the introduction uh, later in the Blair government of the Supreme Court um, as a uh, replacement for the law lords sitting in the House of Lords. Um, the Human Rights Act requires thinking about the proportional proportionality over this legal remedy or that legal rem remedy as opposed to the previous agenda of pursuing reasonableness. And in some ways, this forces public authorities to be cognizant of a rights agenda to a much greater extent than was previously the case. This was reinforced by a duty being placed upon um, public authorities in the Race Relations Act 2000 to be cognizant of their, uh, their requirement to promote positive race relations. In other words, this is moving from a negative language as, a, uh, as applied to the relationship between the state and the citizen to a positive affirmatory language. Uh, a similar kind of legal and constitutional positivism was also seen in the uh, devolution introduced for Scotland and Wales and renewed for Northern Ireland. Um, I don't have time here to go into the detail of uh, these arrangements of what was termed asymmetric devolution. To some extent, the model was the asymmetric devolution in Spain uh, in the post-Franco years. Um, the, nor do I have time to go here into the extent to which this hasn't quite worked, as we've seen with the uh, growth of nationalism, particularly in Scotland, instead of settling these issues, um, it has arguably made the situation worse, which is certainly not an argument for not doing it. Worse from the point of view of the Union, I, I, I hasten to add. Um, it could, however, be argued that devolution was kind of neither one thing nor another. It wasn't a 
renewed vision of a constitutional order. Indeed, I remember talking uh, to Robert Hazel when he set up the constitution unit at UCL in the run up to New Labour coming to power and talking to him about, well, obviously we are going to start off by uh, thinking through what is the constitution, what should it be doing, how do we design the relationship between uh, state and citizen, to which Robert replied, no, well, that would be nice, but we haven't got time. What we've got to do is simply map out the kinds of things that Blair might do in power and uh, identify key areas. Um, and that indeed is what happens. So what you have is a bit of reform at the House of Lords where most of the um, hereditary peers are taken out, a uh, mixture of uh, changes to electoral systems. Uh, so you have PR systems of varying kinds introduced for London elections, Scottish elections, um, and elections to the European Parliament, but not for Westminster, where a commission is set up uh, under Lord Jenkins, uh, formerly known as Roy Jenkins, um, but nothing is done about actually implementing it. There are also changes to the uh, law courts and to the legal system and to local government. In particular, elected mayors and where you don't have elected mayors, cabinets are introduced to local government to give this impression of decisive um, uh, executive rule and also to give the impression, but often not the actuality, of accountability uh, alongside it. Arguably, instead of making local government closer to the public, it has, however, made local government, and indeed government in general, feel more remote with long-term and arguably detrimental consequences for the quality of British democracy. Whilst the constitutional agenda pursued by New Labour was clearly different in many substantial ways from that of its Conservative predecessors, uh, commentators at the time claimed to discern more continuity with that of the um, Thatcher governments um, in the area of economic and social policy. Um, as we can see from this cartoon from 2000 by the cartoonist Frank Boyle. Arguably, however, in these areas, the um, influence came more from America, well, present uh, under Clinton, and then the No Child Left Behind Act uh, under the Bush, um, George W. Bush administration in 2001 and its influence in shaping uh, the white paper Every Child Matters in 2003. The proximate cause of this white paper was the murder of Victoria Climbier, uh, a child left uh, to die through neglect uh, and the uh, negligence or of the social services in handling this case was uncovered by the subsequent reports by Lord Lamming. In particular, Lamming drew attention to the way in which multiple agencies have been aware of Victoria um, Climbier's uh, injuries and neglect and had not coordinated the uh, relationship between them so as to effectively intervene. It thus built upon the 
government's existing program of Sure Start Children's Centres, which have been introduced in 1998 and which also built upon previous American experience. The idea was that the additional support these would provide in areas of deprivation would tackle the um, developmental issues amongst children um, and provide a more positive alternative to the draconic language of ASBOs that the government was also using, that this was a way of socialising uh, people as opposed to the social control that was used in New Labour's policing rhetoric. On one level, the answer to what was new about New Labour is not a lot, given that so many of the policies and ideas originated elsewhere. Nevertheless, at its core, New Labour did mark a substantial refashioning of his party by Blair in opposition, with a core narrative around social change, economic responsibility and national renewal. Renewing a country is arguably more difficult than rebranding a party, particularly given the various crises which, from time to time, almost inevitably, will require immediate response. Nonetheless, in a series of measures on matters such as child poverty, the constitution, or emissions reductions, whatever may be said about the detailed effects, the Blair government demonstrated that there was much more to them than simply a matter of style and spin. <laughs>